Hello, everyone, and um, welcome to another episode of Emerge. Um, I hope everyone is having a fantastic day today. Um, my name is Tuyan Stoichev. I'm part of the Resin Biosense team. Um, before we get going with the session, the usual housekeeping announcements. Um, we are recording the session, um, and we're going to make the recordings as usual on our YouTube channel, um, where you can see the rest of the episodes as well. Um, please post your questions in the Q&A box or the chat box. We'll have plenty of time to get to these. And of course, if you want to have your question or comments um, live, we can do that as well. We encourage a bit of a discussion on this platform. And so you can use the raise hand icon and I'll activate your microphone at the end of the presentation. Um, so today I have the pleasure of, of, of welcoming an echo. Uh, from the uh, Center for Proteomics at Cambridge University. Um, and Echo completed his PhD at the University of Barcelona, where he um, studied viral evolution and protein synthesis and how to re engineer viruses to make them oncolytic, so they attack tumors. Um, in 2016, he became a Wellcome Trust Fellow um, at the Cambridge Center for Proteomics where he's been developing methodologies uh, to understand RNA and protein interactions. And so today he's gonna to be telling us about some of the workflows that he and his uh, colleagues have developed in the Catherine lab that allow us to um, look at protein uh, RNA interactions uh, and also how they localize within the cellular uh, compartments. So Aneko, first of all, thank you very much for, for taking the time to present today, um, and I really look forward to your presentation. Yeah, thank you very much for, for the keen introduction. Sorry. Okay, so thank you for the keen introduction. I'm sorry for the, for the technical problems that have to be there always when studying any presentation. So as uh, Toyin was saying, I will present you today what has been my work in the Cambridge Center for Proteomics for quite a while now, but I'd like to start with the first useful disclaimer and uh, almost everything that we present you today has been the result of a very productive collaboration between the University of Cambridge, so the Department of Biochemistry, Catherine's Lilly Lab, and the MRC uh, Toxicology Unit. And a lot of people has been implicated in, in generating all this data. And again, so I'm basically just the career in here. So I'm just the person that will communicate the results more than anything else. So again, the talk is gonna be basically about RNA protein interactions. I don't think that I will need to give a very long introduction for you to know what they are. Probably if you're here already, uh, you're interested about RNA protein interactions, but for the great majority of the people when talking about these two molecules interacting together, they think about, for example, a ribosome, a very well established a complex of RNA and proteins. But they think that we need to expand this, this uh, idea to any protein that can interact with RNA. For example, think about the RNA polymerase. Of course, it's an RNA binding protein. It synthesizes RNA it's in contact with RNA. But if you think even in condensed uh, chromatin, there are like 800 different non coin RNAs interacting with a huge range of proteins. And there are other proteins like glycolytic proteins that I assume that almost no one of you will say that they are RNA binding proteins, but indeed it has been found that glycolysis can be regulated by RNA in a process called riboregulation. And we will talk about that a little bit more later. Finally, of course, I mean, for the ones of you more interested about viruses, you know that around half of known viruses are basically made of RNA and protein. So for the virologists in the room, probably you know about RNA proteins as much as I do. So, but generally speaking, so how many RNA binding proteins do we have as humans? So and a very optimistic way of seeing it will be close to 3000. I think that the more realistic number will be around 2000 proteins interacting with RNA. And many of them are related to disease. So to disease prognosis. So if you care about biomedical research, Give it a thought and, and consider if your protein may be binding RNA. And I will explain you how to check it later on in the talk. And for the ones of you that care more about applied biology, uh, applied biology sorry. So, for example, in 2017, what Bill, 
feels like ages. Now I use binding sites for different RNA binding proteins to give specificity to viral replication, preventing uh, viruses to replicate in non-tumoral cells, but allowing replication in tumor cells, giving a specificity for this kind of therapies. So RBPs can also be useful if you care about biotechnology. So generally speaking, how do we study RNA protein interaction? So if you just care about a given RNA binding protein, uh, which is the RNA that is there, so probably many of you will have done or at least know about CLIP kind of experiments where you cross-link RNA and protein, and then you immunoprecipitate a given protein and sequence the RNA that is bound to it. But this is more a high to put kind of talk. So what happens if you want to catalog or determine all RNA binding proteins in a given system. So it, it, if that's, that's the case, one option you have, if your biological model has the RNAs polyvinylated and you care mainly about mRNAs, what you can do is you can also cross-link the proteins to, to your RNA and use complementary oligodetoid bits to recover every protein that is crosslinked to these mRNAs. But what happens if you care about proteins that are bound to any RNA on your system or your biological model doesn't have, doesn't polyvinylate your RNAs? So then more recently, all the methods based on phase separation were developed where they basically use trisol to recover RNA binding proteins. And I'm quite well aware of them because I was one of, of the members of a team that developed one of these methodologies that I will explain you a little bit more about now. So this first half of the talk is going to be mainly about OPS or thorough organic phase separation. And the second part is going to be about how to localize RNA proteins and RNA binding protein interactions uh, at the subcellular level. So basically how we end up developing OPS. So we started with cells as many biologists do, and then we cross-link them. With cross-link just with 254 nanometers. So this is basically a normal usual cross linker that you can find in many labs. And then what we speculated at that point was that if you do a normal trisol extraction, something that many people do to obtain RNA or protein on, out of the samples, where we know that the RNA goes up to the aqueous phase and the protein goes down into the organic phase. What we speculated at that point was that if we had cross-link adults, the RNA will push, let's say, up, the protein will drag it down, and the RNA uh, proteins together will not be comfortable in any of these places, so they will be retained in the interface. Then, just you remove the aqueous phase, you remove the organic, you repeat this phase separation several times, and uh, we thought that we, in this way, we will be able to enrich for these adults. Then, if you care about the protein-bound RNA, you can degrade the, the proteins and recover the RNA. But if you care about the RNA and the proteins, you can follow exactly the opposite kind of, uh, of approach. And by digesting the RNA, recover the RNA binding proteins. Importantly, at that point, previous method to recover RNA binding proteins were not as, as efficient as, as we needed in the lab, indeed. We will, you will see later on for what. Uh, but fortunately, this is just a normal trisol extraction. You know, so you can use your normal amount of biological material. So let's start with the protein-bound RNA just as an excuse to show how unbiased the method it is so that you are later on able to recover RNA-binding proteins bound to any RNA. So first of all, when you check how, so which are the species of RNAs that are retained in the interface. So in gray here, this is a normal RNA extraction. And then what is retained in the interface, as you can see, even just by looking at, at a normal RNA size distribution, it's pretty similar. I have to recognize that this, this plot is quite meaningless, but if you sequence that, what you can see is that the RNA that is trapped into the interface represents basically the entirety of the transcript upon crosslink. And that's quite relevant. And it was almost completely equivalent, but for a, small loss of coverage in the three prime UTR. And we know that the great majority of RNA binding proteins bind RNA in the three prime UTR. And indeed you have a loss of coverage in the sequencing experiment, exactly what those RNA binding proteins were, were occupying the, the place in, in the transcriptome. So we use that to recover the RNA binding um, localization in the transcriptome for, for the entirety of the, of the transcriptome. 
But this is quite relevant for mainly the RNA people and cell biologists in the room because this basically this perfect representation of every RNA being trapped in the interface upon cross-linking. And I mean almost every RNA, regardless of the size, because this basically means that the RNA by itself does not exist in the cell. So RNA as a free living molecule is never present in the cell. RNA is always present by protein. So if you care about RNA, you have to care about the RNA binding proteins that are decorating it. I'm talking about RNAs longer than 100 nucleotides that are the ones that we sequenced. But what happens with the RNA binding protein that is what we care more about in this talk? So in order to determine which proteins were enriched on those interfaces, what we thought is that we will follow a silo kind of approach. So we grow cells in, in media containing different kind of isotopes, heavy isotopes or light isotopes in this case only. And what we did is we cross in one of the conditions. Of course, we, uh, we swap the labels and everything to avoid biases, but for, for the sake of simplicity, let's, let's leave it like this. And then we just perform a trisol extraction, also of oops, phase separation, mixing these two conditions together. So if there is any kind of protein that loves to be in the interface because it likes it and not because of the crosslink, it will be seen in the mass spec experiment as a contaminant. And we will be able to measure which are the proteins that are going there because of the crosslinking effect. So what we found is that in the first interface, basically nothing was enriched. So this was quite disappointing. But we continued in washes and washes of repetitions of this phase separation. And what we found is that upon cross-linking, basically there was a massive enrichment of RNA binding proteins. And we had an population of protein that was present in the interface always and not changing upon cross-link. And this is something that we later on use for normalization in nowadays experiments but basically are the glycoproteins. Glycoproteins basically are proteins bound to a change of suvars. And a um, protein crosslinked to an RNA is basically a protein crosslinked to a change of suvars for, in, for, from the biochemical perspective. So it was the spectable contamination is there. So this is just yes, for you to keep in mind that if you find a lot of glycoproteins, uh, don't, don't be super excited about. But something else we found is that the proteins that were in the interface that were not glycoproteins, that were not enriched because of the crosslink, indeed, many of them were still RNA binding proteins. And we speculated at that point that what could be happening is that some complexes were so stable that we were not able to, to really open them even after several rounds of trials. So in order to try to prove that, we went back to the, to the bench and do another cell like experiment but now cross-linking both of the conditions and doing OOPs separately in both samples, but treating one of them with RNAs and the other one without. Then at that point, we mix the sample. And what we did is check what was depleted now from the interface because of the RNAs treatment and what it was migrating down to the organic phase now enriched because it was leaving the interface and going to the organic. And what we found is that indeed, almost everything but glycoproteins was migrating down into the organic phase after, after the RNAs treatment. Regardless if they were well-known RNA binding proteins or still uncharacterized RNA binding proteins. So we used that and recovered the great majority of RNA binding proteins on our system. But Importantly, we apply it to tumoral, non-tumoral models, and we recover the great majority of what were known RNA binding proteins, and indeed many new ones, just the usual geo terms that we have to always put in this kind of high throughput analysis. Of course, the great majority of the terms we found since we were enriched for RNA binding proteins are RNA related, regardless if if it was, uh, if they were properly annotated as RNA binding proteins or not, something that is always a little bit concerning when analyzing geo terms. So I assume that many of you will think at this point that we were quite happy, but in my usual paranoid mode, I indeed I was quite concerned, but because as you have seen, 
we were recovering many new proteins as a putative RNA binding proteins. And I didn't want to invest my time in here just validating one after the next. So we thought, okay, there has to be a way to validate, to validate them at a high throughput level. So that's what we did. So what we did is we took our interfaces and we partially digest them with lysine. And then use two different ways to retain the RNA with the peptides bound to it, but clean the remaining peptides. So or elude them from silica columns, or they are pretty bad precipitated in, in ethanol, while RNA is pretty good. So we use this way to recover the peptides that are crosslink to the RNA. Then we further digest the RNA and the peptides to distinguish between what is the absolute peptide that is crosslink and what is the adjacent one. And the reason is that at this point, nowadays we have a little bit of better methods because this field is super rapidly, rapidly evolving. But at that point, the methods to really try to make the mass spec understand what was going on when crosslinking the sample were not so good. And in this way, we were able to have a better coverage of what is the adjacent peptide and later on at the bioinformatics level, trace back where was exactly the, the binding happening. So we put the adjacent peptides on the mass spec and following this approach, we were able to validate over 50% of our novel RNA binding proteins so knowing exactly what they were holding the RNA and I will give you some examples now. So first, I mean, for the great majority of proteins, they were binding RNA in the using the spec RNA recognition motifs, but we had many others. So let's start first with well-known RNA binding proteins without this kind of very well-conserved motifs. For example, this is a tRNA amino acid transferase binding a tRNA here. What we said that using our method, we were saying that the cross-linking was happening in this solid helix in here. And indeed, this is exactly the residues. These are the residues that are less than for Armstrong, so perfect distance for cross-linking. And inside of this massive ball in here, so this is the, the ribosomal RNA maturation complex, of course, all proteins in here bind RNA. And in yellow, there are the ones that were found in previous screenings. Of course, all of them bind RNA, but the blue one in here was not recovering any high throughput screen before. And we were saying that the binding side was happening using a single amino acid there. And indeed, this is this amino acid here perfectly at cross-linking distance to the RNA. So pretty happy with our results. Moving to more exciting kind of proteins, this is one of probably my favorite results on the paper because over almost 30 years ago, GAPDH, a protein that probably not many of you will, will think that is an RNA binding protein, but was postulated to be able to bind RNA. And indeed, for years, people have been able to make it bind RNA in vitro, but no one found it in vivo. And we were not even only able to find it, but also we found that it was binding RNA through two different peptides completely far away one to, to the other one in the primary sequence. But when the protein is folded, these peptides are these two that are in the same Rosman folder domain, exactly the place that it was postulated to be able to bind RNA. This is where we are uh, finding it interacting and crosslinking to the RNA. For the biomedics in the room, many of you know that PARP is not only a DNA binding protein, but also an RNA binding protein and indeed a drug target for different kinds of cancers. So what we found is that of course, that this protein is binding RNA through these beautiful zinc fingers in here, but we found the secondary place of interaction that is this one that is exactly the kind, the catalytic place where the drugs are interacting. And this has opened very interesting collaboration with the industry that I cannot talk more about, but just to tell you that, yeah, that there were more interesting findings there. But now let me let me go through one of my obsessions when developing methods. And you will see this in this one in oops and the one that I will tell you about later on. That is when you are the only one doing something, or it's I mean, probably you will see many things that are real, but maybe you see also other things that are not so real sometimes and unless more people go to the same places and try to do the same thing that you have done one and over again we will not be able to clean what was a real result 
to what it was a not so real one. So, yes, one second, okay, a little bit more light. So, this means that for me, I really care when developing methods on how to make them replicable so everyone can use them in their conditions and we can make the field to progress way easier. But another one, as a, and basically as a biologist, what I like to do is to challenge the system. So if we have these two animals in here and you have to distinguish which one is real and what, which one is not, probably a very easy way to do it will, will be to make them do whatever, do something, run away from you, for example. One of them will be able to do it, the other one will probably stay in place, and this will allow you to distinguish which one is a real animal. On a different words, do dynamic experiments, challenge your system. Well, this is exactly what we do, just as a showcase, for example, using a given cytostatic drug, I think that this was nacodazole. We synchronize cells in different stages. And what is important is that from the same sample, you can collect proteins to do your normal total protein experiment, but you can do OOPs on them and you can recover the RBPO. And that's quite relevant because using this framework, you can determine that, of course, in different stages of cell cycle, you have abundance, uh, cha uh, changes in abundance of different proteins. But what we found is how RBPs change in the way in which they interact with RNA, and we can correct on each other. So it's, there are proteins that, if they are more abundant, they bind more RNA, and if they are less abundant, they bind less RNA. Probably not so interesting sometimes. We care more about the proteins that bind more or less RNA not because of the total amount of protein that is there, but for further because of further regulation. I will not bother you with a lot of results now. You have the publications, but something that was shocking for us was how glycolytic proteins that at that point was not so clear if they were RNA binding proteins or not, we found them there and we found them binding RNA in a very coordinated way in different stages of the cycle. And we're talking about glycolytic proteins, I'm talking about the great majority of the proteins that are part of the glycolysis pathway. So this was quite a shocking result for us. So if you want to know more about OOPS, this was published in 2000, uh, 2019, just, just before the pandemic, then we had many, many requests on how to buy it. I think OOPS has well over 1,000, 50 citations of groups using around the world to determine our binding proteins to the different systems. So in order to try to address many of the questions that we had on these beta testers almost, uh, what we did is develop a step-by-step -step protocol. So if you are ever interested in applying OOPS in your system, I highly encourage you to go and check this publication. And if you are unsure of, of if it's good for, for your biological system or if there is any other method that maybe works a little bit better for you. Uh, we wrote with authors developing similar methods to recover RNA binding proteins, a joint review explaining the weaknesses and the strengths of, of all of them. So I hope that at this point, I already convinced you that if you care about RNA and proteins, you have now a new tool to catalog, which are the RNA binding proteins in the system. You can also put these pieces together using a variation of the approach in order to know which are the peptides that are bound to the RNA. And you can use the very same system, the very same approach to determine RNA binding protein dynamics. But many RNA binding proteins or binding RNA is not their main role. So we would like to know in theory where those interactions are happening. So if you really want to characterize a system, you really want to know where in the cell these interactions are happening. And this opened a very massive kind of worms in here that is gonna be basically the, the idea of how the cell is organized. Because we know that every cell is organized, but eukaryotic cells are more organized than others. And they are composed of different organelles that are very dynamic uh, entities that are composed of course of lipids, proteins, and RNA. So which are the different proteins and RNA that populate different organelles? So I always advise the same thing to everyone. So if your question is targeted, go for a targeted map. If you just care about one or few proteins, don't complicate your life too much. Buy an antibody if you have one available and do immunofluorescence on them and check where the, where the protein of interest is. 
If you are a super wealthy lab, maybe you can do this for many, many proteins, but for the great majority of the groups, this is not an option. So if you care about a given compartment, a given organelle, and you can engineer your cells, and you have proteins that you know that only belong or are only living in this specific compartment, you can engineer a protein in order to uh, express a biotin ligase and biotinylate the surroundings of your specific niche of interest. And then you can use your standard proteomics. I always favor Silac as you have seen, but any label frequentation is always an option for you to retrieve which are the proteins that are biotinylated and enriched on your compartment. But what happens if your method, if your biological system cannot be engineered or you don't have specific proteins that lead that? So you have all the school methods. So we know that, for example, in this example, mitochondria sediments earlier than Golgi or ER. So you can use this kind of all the school biochemical approaches to enrich for organelles. Or what we do in the lab, you can use a similar approach to and reach for all compartments at once on a single experiment. So how do we do that? So we do what we do, for example, in this example, will be just a density gradient running the entirety of your cell life sitting here. And then we use, we take them, label them with TMT, so we can run everything at the same time in the mass spec, saving quite a lot of machine time, money, and helping a lot with, with identifications. But what is relevant for us is that after many years of doing this kind of approach, we have sets of markers, proteins that we know that belong to a given organism. So for example, mitochondrial proteins in here. So mitochondrial proteins sediment in this way along the grain. And cytosolic proteins sediment in this way on the grain. So this is the correlation profile, is the technical word, but we, we can call them the signature, the signature of a given compound. Then we can plot all the different fractions, all the dimensions in, in this, in this uh, projection, PCSN, whichever you prefer. But what is relevant is that later on, any other protein that is not a marker can be classified if it's similar, it has a similar correlation profile to the one of the marker, can be classified as belonging to this compartment. So nowadays, of course, I mean, and we call this method LOPIT or localization of organ proteins by isotope tagging, because as I told you, this really requires very precise quantitation. So we highly encourage you to do TMT experiments in this, in this case. Nowadays, we have transition from just pure classification to even model the uncertainty of a protein to belong to a given compartment or even to be shared between different compartments, because for example, this protein doesn't really belong to one or the other, but is indeed shared between different compartments. This is especially relevant for dynamic kind of experiments, because sometimes you don't know where your protein of interest was or where it's going, or indeed many times in biology, you don't even know which is your protein of interest until the very end on, on your research. So it's quite useful to have a general map of where all proteins are or, and where all proteins go after stimulating, to have this kind of maps of, of dynamics of localization. And of course, I mean, you kind of have in here, so the, the publication that of the algorithms that we use to define what is a real bind uh, mover and what is not, or performing previous kind of approaches. This is probably not the first time that you hear about this kind of approach. We have published extensively in the lab about and collaborated with many groups to characterize many systems like this. So if you just care about proteins, you have an, an easy, uh, probably an easy journey. So, but if you care about RNA binding proteins, there are RNA binding proteins. So you have to care about the RNA also in your system. Because indeed many times, I think that for the proteomics community, you have to think that around 2000 proteins, the place in which where they localize is RNA. RNA is such a massive molecule in comparison with proteins that it can't even be considered as a localization for many. Okay, so if you don't localize correctly the RNA, you will be mislocalizing all RNA binding proteins. So, how do you localize RNA? So, as you do with antibodies in with proteins, you can do the same thing with 
oligos for fish, and you can uh, take a direct look under the microscope of where an RNA is. If you have many, this can start to be challenging. If you want to co-localize with proteins, this is close to a nightmare, currently. If you care about a given compartment, RNA can also be biotinylated. So like proteins, so the approach is the same, therefore the limit is the same. You have to engineer a given cell line for every localization you want to study. It works very well with very defined organisms like mitochondria, not so well with open compartments. And when doing dynamics, you have to really pick your favorite localization to do dynamics, being honest. So with that in mind, can we use the same kind of correlation profiles that we use to generate these maps of protein localization to also generate maps of RNA and maps of RNA protein interaction? Yes, we can. This is a map of RNA, but I will show you how we arrived at this point. <laughs> so in theory, the approach should be easy, isn't it? Because I mean, proteins are in many places, while RNA is not localized in so many places in the cell and proteins are made of many different amino acids and while RNA is based of four bases out of five that I saw in here so in theory the biochemical space is way smaller the places are fewer so it should be an easier experiment while proteins fall we know also in a very diverse way so they are very diverse population but this is when things start to be interesting RNA falls in a super insane way and very diverse and again RNA is massive so I will not point into the problems of other people's research I will just blame myself first and I will explain you what happened the first time that I try to apply this logic framework to map RNA localization and RBPs it was back in 2017 you start just yes, centrifuging your cell I said and enriching the brains all of the brains, you take them, you run them in these density gradients, and you sample the gradient to collect RNA. The cytosol is recovered from this first centrifugation where you have membranes and cytosol. And what I found is that there was no RNA in the cytosol. Of course, this was absolutely wrong. A good starting point for trying to make things better. And my work during this few years, indeed has been a little bit more challenging than what we anticipated, has been to simplify the protocol until its very bones, so we know that it could not fail. Basically, what I will explain to you now is a super simple protocol, but just to mention again that it took us a little longer than anticipated. So now, the protocol is a single step protocol, almost. So you have to take your cells. For many of you, this is quite a significant amount of cells. If you just care about main localizations of protein and RNA, you can scale this down at least 10 times. If you care about proteins that are traveling in Goldie and minor organelles, because of mass spec limitations, you can to scale it up. But then basically you have to lyse your cells in a controlled way. So don't make a soup, otherwise everything will be in the same soup. But if you lyse the cells gently, then the only thing that you need to do is a single density centrifugation. All the buffers and everything, I will point you later on to the uh, publications. So if you are interested, you can do it. But again, single centrifugation overnight, you go home and sleep very well, come back the next, next day to the lab, you sample your gradient, and you just perform phase separation, as I told you before. RNA goes up, proteins go down. At this moment, it's not cross-linked. It's not cross-linked, then you do RNA-seq and proteomics. For the ones of you that really want to see the gradient, this is how the gradient looks like. For the ones of you that really don't trust high throughput, I don't know what are you doing here, but maybe there is someone in the room and you just prefer to see things at the Western blood level. So, okay, those are markers of ER, mitochondria, nucleolus, histones, and cytos uh, cytoskeleton, cytosome. As you can see, they have a different pattern of sedimentation. Fine. Let, let's go with the real thing. So what happens if we take these fractions and we put them in the mass spec? So again, what we were looking for in here were correlation profiles. And simply just a visual inspection set, uh, is able to, to show that they are different to each other. And this is all we care about. Then we can project all these proteins 
in higher dimensional and in, in dimensional reduction kind of maps. But what is relevant is not so much this. I could make up the colors and, and show you whatever I wanted. The, what is relevant is this F1 score. This means how good are we able to predict where the markers of known localizations are. So things that we really know what they are, if we are able to localize them properly. And as you can see here, the great majority of the numbers are pretty close to one, meaning that we were spot on localizing the great majority of localization and did many localization at the same time. But we were able to do this before. So what happens with the irony back? So we, do, we did the same thing. We obtained correlation profiles. And again, RNA is not in so many places. So we had low specific correlation profiles for nucleolus, nucleus, cytosol, ER, mitochondria, and something else in the cytosol that I will tell you about later on. What is relevant is that, to our knowledge, this is the first time that RNA can be localized at a systems level, at a complete cell level, at once, and not only RNA, but together with proteins. So, something else that is probably even the most important part of this kind of approach, it is that it's a closed system. So this means that if an RNA or a protein is not in one localization, it has to be in another one, because we put everything in here. This allows us to deconvolute any profile into the contribution of the profiles of the markers. And this allows us basically, make a long story short, to have an absolute quantitation of the relative amount of localization, so of an RNA, for example, that should be 100% localized in the ER, so sorry, in the nucleus, or uh, ERs in here, or um, cytosol. We can localize them properly, but we can do this at a systems level, and we can do this for every localization, having not only classifications, but absolute quantitation of how much of every RNA is in every given localization. Okay, again, as you can imagine, having these quantitative maps will be something very positive. In reality, again, we were super concerned because it's already challenging enough to quantify the localization of one RNA. Doing it for all of them it was super challenging. So what we thought is, again, can we validate things at a high throughput level? So for opt for proteins, we have two different flavors. We have one of them using densities, and we have another one using the sedimentation speed. So basically, you put your cell age you spin it down, things become a pellet, whatever has not pelleted, you transfer it to a new tube, spin it down again at a higher speed, whatever has not pelleted, you transfer it back again to another tube, so on and so forth, until you can trace these correlation profiles based on the sedimentation speed of the different organelles. Can we do the same for RNA? We can, but we have to keep in mind that our mass is more. And when working with proteins, as you can see here, we can go up to, 120,000 Gs, that is insane, because for RNA, you have to stop at 5,000 Gs. If you go above that, the RNA will, the longer RNAs will start to sediment. We can go to the supplementary information of the publication that I will show you later. But I think that the safe place to stop is 5,000 Gs. With that, these are five independent replicas, is enough to have localization for both protein and RNA on mitochondria, nucleus, cytosol, and ER. Fortunately, no subcytosolic resolution. But importantly, we avoid completely the size bias that we found in any other methodology because thinking almost any method to obtain subcellular localization, and you will see how the centrifugation speed of almost everything is above 5,000 years. So with that in mind, how well does our Learn approach compared to this new validation approach. It did pretty well. So things that we say that were in membranes are in the this cluster, the nuclear and uh, the nuclear ones are in the nuclear cluster, the cytosol ones are in the cytosol cluster. Again, these plots probably are meaningless. What is important is the quantitation. And as you can see, they agree remarkably well, considering that they are completely different approaches based on completely different physical chemical properties. So just to very quickly go for some of the novelties, I will not bother you a lot with RNA because it's not the point of the talk, but we found transcripts coding for cytoskeletal proteins being translated in the periphery of the ER, 
we were not expecting this at all. And indeed, we validate many of our findings by single molecule fees. And indeed, they were heavily enriched in the periphery of the year. Later on in the publication, we determine which are the factors responsible of the RNAs to be there. Uh, and the, indeed, the in situ translation. But many people, in, when I present this kind of talk, usually care about what is cytosol like, which kind of proteins are there, which kind of RNAs are in this other place in the cytosol, what is it? So in order to try to address this question, we will have a suspicion of what it was, but we challenged the system to be sure. What we did is we treat ourselves with Tapsigargin. This basically breaks the calcium homeostasis in the ER. This generated a lot of proteins are misfolded in the ER. And this basically induces the unfolded protein response, UPR. And this phosphorylates the initiation to alpha. This means there's no more translation, almost no more translation. And stress granules are formed. And this is what we were looking for. So doing first lop it and determining how the protein changes upon this kind of stimulation, as you can see, Golgi, that is this coloring here, this porous coloring here, almost disappears and this upon UPR stimulation. This is something that you expect. Golgi is a very dynamic organelle. If there is no more protein being translated, proteins will end up in the final localization or they will not reach to Golgi so much. So Golgi was almost deproteinized. But then we had many proteins, these are just four examples, of proteins that were moving from being with ribosomes, probably you, you will like more the kind of TSN approach, it's easier to see. So those are our ribosomes, and these uh, asterisks in here are these proteins. They were with them in normal non-stress conditions. As soon as we challenge the cell, ribosomes go somewhere else, and the proteins go here somewhere in the cytosol. So this somewhere is exactly where a lot of RNAs are going. So a lot of RNAs that we had also in brains or in the ear, they're going to this green cluster in here. This is another way to see it. They are more accumulated in this green cluster. If this is our cytosol light. And indeed, just to make the long story short, this is exactly the same density where we have both P-bodies and stress granules. So what we were finding was were the proteins that were going to stress granules and the RNAs that were going to stress granules upon challenging the cell. Of course, we compare our transcriptomics and proteomic data with available data sets. This is just the transcriptomic one where we saw we agree very well with targeted methods. The pro we identify the proteins responsible of driving the RNAs there. But importantly, uh, it was thought that RNAs encoding uh, proteins that later on will be part of the secretory pathway were not recruited efficiently to granules. And indeed, what we found using this unbiased way to recover for, for granules is that indeed, they go to granules even more efficiently than cytoskeletal RNAs. We can validate our, our findings by single molecule fish, but I would like to almost finish this part of the talk saying that we analyze which all the features drive the RNAs there. and I'm always quite curious about translation. What we found is that the RNAs that go to granules from membranes, they use basically a very specific codon usage. So if an RNA for to translate histidine, so histidine has three different codons, so one of them can be translated anyway. The other two ones require the tRNA to be modified with guanosine. And what we found is that the upon UPR stimulation by doing OPS in the same system, the enzyme that is responsible of this quantity modification stops binding RNA. Therefore, we speculate that the tRNAs cannot be modified. Therefore, translation for those RNAs cannot continue and they go very efficiently to grams. They are recruited to grams. Of course, there are many more findings, but all the details are available in here. So now, if you want to just take out your phones, scan this, or just Google, copy paste. Um, and you will find this publication where we have all the details and hopefully pretty, pretty soon, pretty, pretty soon we will have the official publication across. But just to finish, because I think that I probably exceeded my time quite a lot. So can we use the same kind of profile of going for correlate? So the same kind of approach of using correlation profiles 
to not only have maps of proteins and RNA, no, now that we know that we can localize it properly, but doing it in cross-link conditions so we can have functional maps of where those interactions are happening. Yes, we can. But again, so I think that I've been speaking for quite a long time now. So ready for your questions. Thank you very much, Aneko. It is a really fascinating presentation. Um, so uh, I really enjoy the, the way you guys have evolved this over the years and kind of morphed or in, incorporated different methods to, to talk to each other, I suppose. Um, and I know before we started the, the webinar, we were chatting we were offline about you know, robustness and reproducibility. In, in, in your opinion, what would you say will be the critical steps um, along this, this, this pipeline to, to look out for a way, you know, if somebody's trying to reproduce this, um, can, can fail or make it work? So for me, it depends quite a lot on your background. So if you're a proteomics person, probably you really know that there is nothing in life like a purification. This, this is a myth, something that does not exist. So you really need to do, have a very good set of controls in your experiments. If you come from other fields, sometimes you are more inclined to think that purifications can exist and you start to trim down your experiment to not spend so much, to not have so many samples and to not do so many controls. For me, having always a non cross link control, control or an RNA spray control can be more expensive, but it will save you time later on down the road. For Lopit, is more on the analysis part. So do if you can go for TMT, again, it's more expensive. It will, it, it will give you way better coverage. It will save you also some time and it will allow you a way more robust kind of data analysis later on down the road. So again, so don't trim at the very beginning of the method, go for everything, be, be, save a little bit of money because it will save you a lot of time later on. Okay. Uh, I suppose uh, in terms of Lopez specifically, the gradients are not quite settled in terms of reproducing that. But something you mentioned um, in part of your talk in terms of having these signature profiles, we can map where proteins are based. And so essentially the more data you generate, the more confident you about the profiles you are and they get more additional proteins. Because I see in some of the map, there's these undefined proteins still that were in gray. So I suppose yeah. are these because they're missing a signature profile or they just, their profiles just spread across so many compartments that you can't really allocate them to? I, I, I can be more or less politically correct in here. So I will go for a little bit of a combination. Okay. So, many, so many proteins are multi-localized. And then if they are localized in many places, a lot of it will give you mainly the, studies, the steady state of, of the protein, where, mainly, where yeah. it's mainly localized. That's, that's the politically correct answer. The other one is that we are working with cells in culture that are not perfectly synchronized. So there is also quite a lot of heterogeneity. So for example, I don't know if you realize that the nucleus, so something that should be 100% was like 80% nuclear in our absolute quantitation. But we are working with cells in culture. So at least 10% of our cells are divided and do not even have a nuclear. So things that aren't were in the nucleus suddenly are in the cytosol. Sure. This this kind of, of also limitations on the model you are using. So the more homogeneous your population is, the better defined, so to the better are your maps. Also, you are missing this kind of biological, potentially relevant biological information. So it's and you're just averaging your signal out eventually. So you don't actually know exactly where it is. And it's exactly. I mean. This yeah. is a limitation of, of this kind of method. So it's not single molecule, it's not single cell. So you're just averaging. On the other hand, you can at the same time know the localization of way over 6,000 proteins. So you have to decide. And I suppose it will be the same for the RNA localization that you need to build up uh, more of these signatures in order to be able to understand where they are uh, located. Because I, at the moment, are you looking at where RNA is is essentially known to be found versus where exactly it is found? Exactly, I mean, with RNA, we were, we were starting from, from a weaker point because for proteins, we had our previous lobby maps that were refined over years. So we, we were expecting the, the proteins to be in given places. But for RNA, 
to our knowledge, this is the first system-wide determination of RNA localization. So we knew that there was RNA in the ER, nucleus, nucleolus, this is kind of places, but outside, we don't know, we, we really need markers to define this kind of localization. So whenever co people come to me and say, oh, have you been able to find RNA here? I will tell them, drop me a line with your RNAs of interest because maybe yes, but we don't really know. So yeah, it's like, yeah I mean. Because the more data Run. you have, actually, the more resolution you get from this methodology. Exactly, exactly. And again, so if you are more in interested about the data only, so all proteomics and transcriptomics data is available in this bioarchive publication. So you can go there and you can directly download everything and start playing with it. We have a graphic uh, user interface, so you can just go there, write your protein or RNA of interest, and you can see where it is and where it goes. So we try to make these things of easy access. Yeah, so I see actually there's something I was playing around this week is that you have this this online resource. And are you looking to essentially extend it as you build up these these maps and, and build up so if the community can have access to it? Exactly, um, exactly. That, that, that's what we try. Uh, people many times like to do the experiment themselves, themselves again. It's up yeah. to you. Many times the data is there, but happy to help anyway. <laughs> uh, but maybe a bit of a more technical question in terms of the recoveries that you get is there sufficient material there to start looking at maybe post ablation modifications on these proteins and how they're related to they the are they are RNA? they are indeed for example for proteins we have done some i mean phosphor enrichment of yeah. on the fractions so we have we have done that uh we have played with all the modifications but it will depend again on the efficacy of of your enrichment method more than anything else then a different kind of beast is if you want to check the modification of the protein that is binding the RNA on a given place, we have not gone that that far yet. So this is again so the first uh, map of I think that there are around 800 RNA binding proteins binding RNA in different places. Something that, that again so it's the first time that we have been able to achieve. It would be nice to go to go farther than that but at this point this is what we have yeah it's, it's so maybe challenging yeah yeah i mean again so if you are if you are seeing this in youtube maybe maybe this is already solved but at this moment in 2022 it's not yet okay i'm sure people will drop your line if, if they if they hex um maybe maybe another question to just maybe wrap it up is is around maybe it's, i'm probably missed it so you mentioned specifically the challenge about doing these gradients um, uh, on, on RNA in terms of that the size of the RNA is so much greater than, than proteins and you have to spin down slower for the RNA and essentially at 5,000 to the 500 genes. Yeah. So do you actually then um, do these experiments in parallel for RNA and proteins or do you yeah. start off? Okay. You don't yeah, start you off can't... very slow for RNA and then speed up for the protein fractions? No, we, use, we, usually, you, we usually do for everything. Um, if you care about, for example, Golgi localization, unfortunately, you cannot use the, this, this sedimentation approach because the RNA will start to cause sediment with Golgi. So again, the RNA is, is massive. So if, if you think about a polysome, imagine many ribosomes bound to an RNA, this translating, this, this is a, a crazy uh, big molecule or, or polymolecule. Um, you have to use density. So for that, fortunately, density is still a good enough place to, to distinguish all, everything at once. But again, so it will depend on which is your question. Knowing everything at once, yeah. I will favor density. Knowing main localization that, being honest, a lot of people just care about, can I speak in membranes, maybe mitochondria and ER, nucleus and cytosol. Then you can use bench top centrifuge and go very, very, in a very, very straightforward way have your samples and then do your mass spec and, and transcriptomics. So having a hypothesis and maybe focusing a certain a certain compartment or yeah. localization, it actually could could be beneficial. Yeah. Yeah, or or a set of them. I mean, I would not say a given compartment necessarily, but but a set of them. I mean, for me, I always see the same. So for me, these methods are the tools that we use to answer questions. So it will depend on your question. You will have a, a tool that is better for you. So okay. Is there a specific uh, cellular compartment that would be challenging to to capture? 
I mean, granules were quite of a challenge because granules behave very well for, for RNAs that go yeah. there quite a lot. But proteins, there are not so many proteins that the main localization is a granule. So yeah. a protein is going to be somewhere else and in a granule. So in this way, we were quite pleased to see that, that indeed proteomics was, were, was informing at this point our transcriptomics data. But again, so these places that don't have a real signature or we don't know about a, a given set of proteins that really belong there as markers, so we are blind to them. So I, I always like to toy with the idea that maybe we have all localizations, simply that we don't have the code to really look for yeah. them. Exactly. So yeah. maybe we'll have to revisit our data in, in future. Surely. Uh, this will improve it over time. But um, I don't see any more questions. So I want to thank you, first of all, for taking the time. It was a really interesting uh, presentation. Uh, Hopefully, it's, you guys keep on developing this 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 area, and also to everyone that joined us, thank you very much. And um, as I mentioned, we'll have the recording up, so you can all go look at it and hopefully also spread it around. So, yeah, thank you all, and uh, we'll see you in the next episode. Cheers. Thank you very much. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye.